so what we're going to do today, we're, we will look at another variety of springs. You uh, may have thought that it was a little strange that the springs that we have looked at up till now have all been compression style springs. Uh, that has not been by accident. Um, there's a couple of reasons why we focus so much on compression springs uh, early on. For one, uh, they are very common. You know, it's a very common way to set up uh, a spring if you need one in a mechanical system. Um, I'm not sure whether or not they're more common than these, but they are very common. And we needed to do a few tasks that um, you know, can be applied to a lot of different kinds of springs. Um, you know, the idea of optimization of certain parameters, it's gonna have a very similar look and feel regardless of if you do it for a compression spring or another kind of spring. So we sort, sort of chose one so that that wasn't one of the confusing factors for doing all of those tasks. But I do wanna spend a little bit of time today talking about a couple of other different kinds of springs that are commonly used. Uh, one of these types is called a, an extension spring. Um, extension spring is a little different because they carry tension as opposed to compression, compression, and they have to have these little ends that hook onto something so that they can actually apply those tensile uh, forces. The other thing that's uh, a little bit different about them is that they can carry what is called a pre-tension uh, or, you know, basically what they do is when they wind the springs, they can wind them in such a way as uh, they as they are winding them around the mandrel that makes the spring, they actually cause there to be a little bit of twist in the wire uh, as they are winding it around the mandrel and that ends up taking the spring and making it to where it actually wants to be shorter than it can be, but the coils keep it from being as short as it would be. Um, and so that's, that causes a little bit of a uh, pretension in the spring, okay? So that's, that creates a little bit of a different uh, scenario than we have looked at with respect to springs. And so we'll do a little problem here that not only deals with that, but also deals with another aspect that often goes into uh, devices that employ springs. And that is that there's a lot of times some geometry change that happens when the spring is actually used, right? So that is not particularly a new topic for you guys, but it is something that I figured we should probably throw into a problem so that we get to actually see um, you know, a, a larger impact of a spring design in terms of what it is applied to. Um, the second half of this problem, we're going to do what's uh, called a torsion spring. A torsion spring, instead of it um, employing torsion inside of the coils of the spring in order to uh, create that retraction force or, or a compression force, uh, depending on if you're talking about an extension or a compression spring, Instead of doing that, you actually employ uh, bending forces in the little wire that composes the spring. So uh, a torsion spring, you know, very commonly, you may have seen one of these on a mouse trap or on a clothespin, right? They have a little bit of coiled wire, and instead of it being something you stretch out linearly, you actually cause there to be angular deflection on one end of the spring relative to the other. And so that's why they're called torsion springs. Okay, so we're going to look at this problem um, where we try to find angular deflection of the member uh, CD in both cases under 70 pound loads. In the first case, we're going to do it where we have a uh, extension spring employed as is shown on the figure here. And, you know, with the parameters that are given here, the wire diameter, spring index, number of body coils, etc. Okay. And for the second one, we'll do it for the parameters that are given for a torsion spring that would be applied at joint D. All right, so that's what we've got on tap for the day. So my question is, where shall we begin? Okay, someone mentions uh, maybe some material properties. Um, perhaps, I'll tell you what, let's actually start with the most new thing that we're going to see today. And it is this idea of this pretension in an extension spring. It, is, it says here, it gives you the piece of information that we want to set up this spring so that it is at the middle of the preferred range of pretension. Okay, so that probably implies that we have some information somewhere in our text about what that middle of the preferred range might be. And uh, sure enough, on page 537, 
um, there's an equation 1041, and that equation 1041 tells you what the uh, torsional stress is that you are going for with your spring, okay, in, when you are at the middle of your preferred range of pretension. Okay, so that's kind of where we'll, we'll start with this. Uh, finding pretension. This is basically how much tension is in the spring before you ever stretch it. It's just sitting there and it already has tension in it. Okay, um, equation, as I mentioned a second ago, equation 1041. It tells us that the um, kind of pre-stress that is in the spring is going to be given with 33,500 over uh, e to the 0 0.105 times spring index c, okay, plus or minus 1,000 uh, times 4 minus the spring index minus 3 over 6.5. Okay. Does that look like a highly theoretical uh, equation there? <laughs> I would say this looks like something that, you know, some spring manufacturer kind of figured out that this is where we're going to try to wind them. And they set up this equation. So there are some things that might be a little bit arbitrary there. But it does give you an idea uh, as to how these springs, how they tend to try to wind them. Okay. So my first question here is this. If we're going to try to... Um, make this spring be at the middle of the range of pretension, what do you think we should do? Okay. We probably don't need to worry about this plus or minus term. Okay. It's going to be at the middle of the range. Okay. So that, that helps just a little bit. Um, and so what we're going to do here is plug in our information. Let's say we have 33,500 over E to the 0 0.105 times our spring index was 5. Right? And so if we plug these in, this tells us that the stress that we have in the spring wire when we have it loaded or when we have the uh, desired amount of pretension in the spring is going to be equal to uh, 19,817 PSI. Okay. Well, how do we use that and come up with uh, you know, how much actual pretension we end up with in the spring. Okay. Well, what we can do is we can flip back um, to a, an earlier equation that we had been using. Um, we can look at uh, equation 10-7. Okay because we actually don't have much of a different case uh, in this case than we do for uh, our normal uh, compressive springs. So we flip way back here to equation 10-7, and we know that stress is going to be equal to Bergstrasser factor times 8 times FD. Okay. And what we're going to do is set this equal to the amount of stress that we just solved. Okay, so we say 19,817 psi is going to be equal to. Okay, Bergstrasser factor is given with four times c plus two. Okay, so four times the uh, spring index that we're dealing with is five. over 4 times 5, which is the spring index again, minus 3. OK. 
Okay. This gets multiplied by 8 times what we're trying to find here is f sub i. Okay, so I'll leave that in there as f sub i times my mean coil diameter. The mean coil diameter is a half inch. Okay, and I sort of had these pre calculated up here in case anyone was wondering. You might be given information, let's say, about uh, wire diameter and about uh, spring index, and a, you know, and based on those, you can calculate what the mean coil diameter would be. All right, so I put that in there, and uh, then I put in the denominator, pi times the wire diameter, and the wire diameter was 0.1 inch. Okay, and that would be cubed. All right, so this is a uh, one equation, uh, one unknown we can solve for F sub I. And it comes out to be 12.03 pounds. All right, so we've done kind of that first part. Let me show you why this matters to us. Uh, this matters to us because for real uh, extension springs like this, very often they are made in such a way, in this way, and that means that when they are closed, let me actually give you a little kind of chart right here where we're plotting force versus deflection, okay? For real springs that are wound this way, they, they don't kind of have the shape that you might remember uh, there being for the curve between force and deflection. What they have instead is that they have some initial force that's in them, and then uh, from there they have a spring constant that comes up at some kind of a uh, slope. Okay, so that spring constant can still be found like we have found in the past. You know, it's still going to be uh, the slope of this thing, right? Because spring constant K is equal to um, what? Okay, force over deflection, right? So that part still works. It's just that it comes in here and now we start out at a force of F sub I. Okay, um, and so for a problem like this, if we're saying that that spring, um, it starts out unstretched at all, you know, then that means we will apply a certain amount of force to the mechanism, right, over there with the force of F. We're going to apply a certain amount of force to this mechanism before it even starts to move, right, because um, we have to get up to this, uh, you know, 12.03 pounds in the spring before it even starts to stretch a little bit, okay? So this is a, a factor for some things. And I bet if you kind of remember back to mechanisms that might employ extension springs, you can probably remember there being some sort of a, a feel like this to those mechanisms, right? You got to push a little bit, uh, and it seems like it might be kind of hard even that you have to push before there's even any deflection at all. But then once it starts to deflect, it will, uh, you know, deform linearly from there. All right, so that's kind of the first part. Where do we go from there, do you think? Okay, we know that a force of 70 pounds is what we want to apply to this thing, but as we apply that force of 70 pounds, this mechanism will move, and it will actually come to some uh, equilibrium position under that 70 pounds of uh, force. All right, so let me actually do this. Um, let's imagine that it has already deformed to that position, right? And when it's at that position, 
we probably need to do some kind of a free body diagram so that we can look at the forces in this uh, overall mechanism. Because the thing is, the amount of force F that I apply at point B isn't going to be the same amount of force that will be carried in the spring, right? Okay, so I guess that's kind of the, one of the biggest things to say here is that be careful because the mechanism um, actually changes how much force you're going to see happening in the spring. And not only that, um, even the ratio between the amount of force that you apply and the amount carried in the spring will change as a result of the mechanism changing position, right? You can imagine this, one of the things that could happen is you could apply so much force that this whole mechanism maybe would uh, deform to where you know, one of the arms was, was kind of really laid over to the side. Well, once that starts happening, then most of force F is probably going to be carried in you know, either member AB or in member CD, right? Especially if that, if that angle gets really, really you know, far, uh, you know, Kind of, kind of flopped over there. All right, so what kind of a free body diagram would you like to do? Because that's what we said we needed to do as a free body diagram to do the force analysis. Okay, someone says we could break it up into different pieces. I agree that we probably want to not do a free body diagram of the whole thing. Um, and you might remember um, we, we had a few methods of dealing with uh, structures like this that we've been using ever since uh, our earliest statics class that we had in here. Um, so what you would do back then, you know, if, you, if this is a truss, and actually that's a comment I probably need to make, is that this structure that we have here is a truss. If you look at any one of the members that composes this structure, they are all two force members. And that means that this is a uh, truss that we have here. It just so happens that one of the members is elastic. All right, so you have trusses. What are some of the methods that we have we can use with trusses? Okay, you can talk about joints or you can talk about method of sections. And I'll just say that it looks to me like method of joints might be our best, um, our best strategy for a problem like this. But here's the thing, we need to do that not for the position that the structure here is shown in because we know that it can move a little bit. So we probably need to first set up in our minds the idea that this arm can move over a little bit, okay? And so let me go ahead and establish here an angle that we can use to describe how far this thing has moved over. I'm going to call that angle theta. So this is basically how far has it deflected angularly relative to vertical. And that actually is the thing that we're trying to find here, right? This angular deflection that I asked for in the problem statement, that is um, the angular deflection that we're trying to solve for. All right, so let's do this. Let's take joint C. All right, joint C right here, and let's imagine doing a uh, free body diagram of joint C, okay? So I'm gonna put that up here, FBD of joint C. Okay, so here's the joint. Now, what kind of forces are applied to that joint? Okay, so the, something someone suggests here is that there's a, a horizontal force coming from F, I believe, okay? And so let me just talk about that for just a second. I won't uh, try to formally prove it here, but let's talk about why it is that that force entirely transmits into member BC and none of it goes into member AB. Okay, we have to do that based on mentally kind of thinking what a free body diagram of joint B would look like. Okay, free body diagram of, of B uh, would have forces, since member BC is a two force member, it would have force F and force in BC would both be horizontal. And the only other force that we could have here would be coming from member AB, uh, which is also a two force member. 
And if it had any force in it at all, there wouldn't be anything to react against it because it has a vertical component, right? So we only have one force that has a vertical component and therefore, because it's going to go to an equilibrium position, um, you know, and that means the sum of forces has to be zero, it means that force in member AB has to be zero, okay? It's kind of the same process that you used back when you were doing this in, uh, in your first statics course where we were finding zero force members. Same logic applies to this based on joint B, okay? So that means this force F entirely transmits into uh, member BC, and so I can go ahead and put that directly on this joint. And that's actually a known value, right? What is that value? 70 pounds. All right, so far so good. We got one force on there. Now what? All right, we've got the force in the spring. And the force in the spring, it comes back along a line that kind of goes toward point A. And let me just call this F sub spring for right now. Okay, do I know how much force is in that spring? Not yet, okay, so I'm just gonna leave it there with that variable. Do I know what direction it goes? Okay, I don't quite, right, because what I have here is that I've, by this uh, arm having moved over a little bit, um, it basically makes a triangle that looks like this. Right, and that means that I can't really use any of my information that I have up here just yet to figure out what direction um, this, uh, you know, this kind of hypotenuse, I'll, maybe I'll call it even though uh, it's not a right triangle, but this line right here, I don't know what angle that line goes along just yet, but it is going to be a function of how far this thing moves, okay? So I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's go ahead and name a variable for that as well. Let's say that this, uh, that angle right there is uh, phi. Okay, so then what? So those are a couple of forces. Now that I've named that phi, I can actually put it here if I want. Okay. Then I have one other force, right? The other force that I have, um, since I know that, or I'm pretty confident that this uh, F spring, I've probably drawn that the, the correct direction. That implies a tension, the direction that I've shown this F sub spring. And I'm pretty sure that that will be a tension. So I'm fairly confident that's the right direction. When I look at this now, I know that there must be a compressive force in member CD, right? or else I won't have forces balance in the vertical direction. So I'm going to show this other force on here as a compressive force, okay? And I'll call this force uh, F sub CD, which I don't know that value yet either, okay? Don't know the value, but do I know anything else about it? Okay, I do know that this angle relative to vertical is going to be equal to phi, or not phi, theta. All right, well this is kind of uh, a little bit messy right now because I, you know, how many equations can I write out of this free body diagram? What kind of a system is it? It's a concurrent force system, right? Which means that I only have sum of forces in X, sum of forces in Y, since it's a 2D concurrent force system. All right, so I can go ahead and write them, but I have four unknowns. I have two equations with four unknowns right now. So let me go ahead and write them anyway. Okay, in the X direction, I have 70 pounds. Uh, minus F spring 
times the cosine of phi plus F sub C D times the sine of theta. All right, and what about the y direction? Okay, here I have minus f sub spring times the sine of phi and then I have plus f sub c d times the cosine of theta. All right, four unknowns, two equations. Now what? I need some more equations. Okay. Well, do I have any more equations? Where, where can I get some more equations? Okay. Here's a, here's a thought about where I can get more equations. I drew this little green triangle up here. There's probably a bunch of stuff I can get out of that triangle if I, if I think about it hard enough. Okay, so let me actually repeat that triangle down here. Okay, that way we can kind of keep it all together. One of the things we said was that this angle right here was phi. We also know that this angle right here, okay, this angle right here is theta. Okay, and you know this, this would be 90 degrees right here. What else do we know about this triangle? Okay, we know a couple of lengths, right? What are some of the lengths that we know? Okay, yeah, the right side of the triangle is three inches, okay? Three inches right here. What about this down here? And what's this length? It's going to be hard for me to draw, but um, you know, the length that goes right here. Let me ask you a question. Between points A and C, before this thing deflects, how long is it? How, what is that length between A and C? Okay. Someone says they can look at it and see that it's going to be five inches. It is a three, four, five triangle, right? If it wasn't that simple, what would you do to find that length? It'd just be the hypotenuse of that right triangle, right? So not work that really nice for these numbers. This ends up being, though, 5 inches plus what? Five inches plus the deflection that happens for the spring. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, what can we do with this triangle? Can I do maybe law of cosines? All right. Yeah, we can do 5 inches uh, plus delta. Okay. That number squared plus 4 inches, or excuse me, equals 4 inches squared plus 3 inches squared minus 2 times 4 inches times 3 inches times what? Cosine of okay. 
So remember here, what you put in here is the angle the, uh, relative to the side that you're kind of treating as the hypotenuse, so to speak, in the, um, uh, in the law of cosines equation. So for this side over here, what you're trying to do is find the angle opposite of that, right? And so the angle opposite of that is 90 degrees plus theta. All right. Well, does that help us at all? <laughs> yeah, so we made another equation that happens to have one of our variables that we were using before, happens to have one variable in there, but we added another variable. Okay, well, is there another way we can, you know, bring some more information in here? Well, yes, there is, because we actually have an equation down here that can help us figure out what the spring constant excuse me, what the spring equation would be for this. Um, it is given in the book, even though it's something we could kind of figure out by looking. I'll give you the equation number anyway. Equation 1038 says that the force carried in the spring is going to be equal to your uh, pre-force, like the initial force in the spring, plus K times Y is what they say there. This is equation uh, 1038, okay, what they mean by Y is actually delta, right? It's how much the uh, spring has stretched, okay? So I'm going to replace that Y there with delta, okay? So cool, we actually can do that. We can say here the force in the spring is going to be equal to that initial force, 12.03 pounds plus, and then here we put in our uh, spring constant. Uh-oh. Do we have that yet? Okay. So we, we need to take a moment and actually figure out what that spring constant is. Good thing that isn't actually very hard. What were my pieces of information for the spring? Okay, I knew index, but from that I could find coil diameter. I already had wire diameter. I have the number of coils. That is, should be all that we need to figure out what the, uh, <coughs> what the uh, spring constant is going to be. So I'm gonna flip back to where we uh, have a, uh, an expression for spring constant. Okay. Let's see, I'll find it here in just a moment. All right, um, kind of the basic equation comes from uh, way back at the beginning, equation 10-9. Okay, let me do this down here. K is going to be equal to d to the fourth g over 8d cubed, oh, capital D, cubed, n sub a. Okay, well there is a little bit of a tricky thing that happens here for extension springs, and that is we have to account for the end coils. The little hooks that are on the end actually are elastic, and so those contribute into what the effective number of active coils is for the spring, okay? So that's gonna be part of what we have to do here. Let's fill in the rest of it first. 0.1 uh, inch to the fourth, where should I get G? Okay, this is a chrome vanadium wire. Okay, and so we can, we can flip to uh, table 10.5, look up chrome vanadium, and um, it looks like the modulus of rigidity value for that will be 11.2 MPSI. Did 
Down here we have eight. Okay. Um, mean coil diameter was half an inch. And now we need to deal with our number of active coils. So for that, let me actually point your attention to equation 1040. It's actually a pretty cool equation. Uh, it's interesting that it winds up being so simple. And uh, the, um, the proof of this is actually in one of the exercise problems that's in the book, and I won't spend time talking about that a whole lot. But all it ends up being is just the number of body coils, which we said we had 18 body coils for this spring, plus the modulus of rigidity over the modulus of elasticity. Okay. This is if the spring basically has the same diameter as the rest of the spring coils, uh, but now is shaped up like a hook. Uh, so anyway, we add to this 11.2 MPSI, and I can drop the units since they will both be in the same kind of units. But to get the elastic modulus, I have to go back to table 10.5 and look at chrome vanadium here. And uh, it says 29.5 uh, MPSI is the E value. Okay, so that little piece I did right there, that comes from equation 1040. Okay, and I'll just write it off to the side. NA is equal to NB plus G over E. All right, so that uh, expression right there gives us the K value, and that sh ends up being 60.94 pounds per inch. Okay, which is handy because now we can take that value and plug it in to the K value I have right here, which goes right up here, 60.94 pounds per inch. Okay, times what? So did we gain any ground with that addition to our question? Yeah, we did gain ground on that because we added an equation, and that equation is in terms of variables that we already had put into our set of equations. So now where are we at? We have four equations with how many unknowns? Okay, we still have five unknowns we have, that we have to deal with. So we need one other thing to help us deal with this, and so let me ask you the question. Do you feel like there is another relationship that we can identify between theta and phi? Okay, we gotta have some geometry stuff, someone says, that's true. We do need to do some geometry stuff. What kind of geometry stuff do you feel like we should do? How about some law of signs? All right. Law of sines is a pretty good of way of relating two angles to each other within a triangle, uh, if you know some of the lengths of the sides. And so the uh, way the law of sines works is if you take, let's say, the, the side opposite of the side where theta is measured, right? so five inches plus delta, and you divide that by the sine of the angle in opposite of that, which um, is going to be 90 degrees plus theta. This is going to be equal to the side opposite of phi divided by the sine of phi.
All right. Now we have five equations, five unknowns. Which is good. It is um, maybe not as good as we could have liked. Okay. One of the reasons for that is that last equation that we put in there turns this system into a nonlinear system. Actually, I guess the uh, law of cosines equation did that too. Okay. So this isn't the kind of five by five system that you can solve with a linear solver. But if you have a solver that can handle nonlinear systems of equations, um, then that helps you out. And that's something that a program like MathCAD can do. So instead of spending time entering this all into MathCAD, let me show you what that might look like. Okay. You just put the equations in. I didn't go in quite the same order um, as the ones that I just developed here, but um, you can see there they are basically the same equations. And it then allows you to solve for a few different things. One of the things that it allows you to solve for is that angular deflection that happens for member CD. But it also gives you several other things. It gives you the force in link CD. It gives you the uh, deflection of the spring, right? The deflection of the spring uh, is 1.737. Uh, the spring will be carrying 117.9 pounds of force. And then it also gives you fee if that's something that you uh, find interesting for some reason. Okay. So 58.174 degrees is the angle theta. All right, any questions at this point about that uh, problem? Yeah. Okay, so someone asks the question, how would something like this look on the exam uh, since we don't have a five by five solver? Okay, so let me, uh, let me flip the question back around and say, what do you think I might do? Okay. Do you feel like there might be a way to simplify the same type of logic to the point where the tools that you have at your disposal could solve any kind of a system that came out of it? OK. okay. So that, you know, I won't promise anything, but that, uh, that's probably what you had in mind anyway. All right, so there is the first part of the, of the problem. Any other questions about this before we move to the torsion spring? Yeah, the ones over here. Is that what you want to see? Anything else while we're uh, looking at the answers? All right, so let's look at the torsion spring. Okay, we're supposed to find the angular deflections, basically the same question, of member CD under a force of 70 pounds, assuming the tension spring is replaced with a torsion spring, where uh, we know the mean coil diameter of the torsion spring, the wire diameter of the torsion spring, and the number of turns that we have for the torsion spring. That's basically how many times does it coil around to where it goes back to where it belongs. So that's basically or where, it, where it ends up. Um, that what that kind of looks like if you were to implement this on joint D, it would basically be this wire that would start down here. It would go around this uh, arbor, this part in the middle is called, four, four and a quarter times, and then it would stick up. Okay, 
it's hard to see it from that angle because you wouldn't be able to see all the coils, but that's basically what it does. It comes around, goes around this little, the arbor, that word is basically like a little peg that the uh, coil goes around. Okay. So what do we do with this? Well, we open pray a section in the book that kind of talks about this because that would help us out a lot. Um, turns out it does have a little section that talks about this. Um, it does give a little bit of guidance here. It says, use an equation that accounts for the friction between the coils and the arbor. That's the first thing that's kind of interesting here is that um, they work on this problem of figuring out what would the spring constant be for a torsion spring. And they come up with, uh, you know, equation 1050 that says that equation would be wire diameter to the fourth times elastic modulus over 10.2 times D times the number of active coils, D being the uh, uh, mean coil diameter. Then it says, Tests show that the effect of friction between the coils and the arbor is such that the constant 10.2 should actually be increased to 10.8. All right, so that's just one of those things that, you know, evidently um, testing doesn't actually bear out what the theory would have said. All right, so we're going to use that one where uh, it accounts for the friction, or at least as they cite it here, between the friction and the and uh, friction between the coils and the arbor. Um, personally. If there is friction, I'm not sure that's how it would show up in equations, but you know, I didn't write the book, so um, we'll go ahead and, and take them at their word. Here's what I want to show you, though. Uh, we're going to here find the spring constant of this uh, torsion spring. It does this uh, using a variable that they use called k prime. Okay, K prime is equal to, according to equation 1051, K prime is going to be equal to the wire diameter to the fourth times the elastic modulus over 10.8 times the mean coil diameter D times N sub A. Okay, we know a few of these values. Oh, here's what I was going to say. I, I didn't finish my thought. K, this K prime, it's really important that you understand that that prime right there is very important. There's a couple of different ways that you can express a spring constant for a torsion spring. One of them is in terms of torque per number of radians. But another way you can do it is in terms of torque per turn. And if you see something with a K prime like this, that gives you torque per turn. Okay, or in other words, torque per revolution, right? If you revolve it a complete revolution, this equation gives you um, that ratio of torque to number of revolutions. Okay, that was the thought I, would, I didn't quite finish a second ago. The one I was about to start was the idea that, again, we need to deal with the ends of the spring, okay? Because the ends of the spring work a little bit differently than the coils of the spring. And so N sub A, we don't use just 4.25 turns for N sub A. We need to also deal with the fact that we have these little, um, you know, kind of these little uh, arms that stick out from there, okay? So I'll say that that's how it works uh, in the general case. One of the things that you can do to minimize that effect is to make the arms that stick out a little bit shorter, right? If you make them short enough, then you can start ignoring the effect of that. So uh, I want to basically point out that we have equation uh, 1048, okay? 1048 says the equivalent number of active turns N sub A is expressed with N sub A plus N sub B plus the length, the sum of the length of the two uh, extensions that come out uh, over 3 pi D. All right. Um, 
So do we have any information that allows us to use that? Okay. One and a half inch ends. Basically saying one and a half inches away from here, right, is where the ends of these springs are uh, effectively applied. Okay, so what we do here is we do the wire diameter, I'll start building this equation, 0 0.09 inches to the fourth. The elastic modulus we have, I believe if I remember correctly from uh, table 10.5, chrome vanadium is 29.5. And this was in MPSI. Okay, down here I have 10.8 times D, which was 1.25 inches. And then my number of active coils, I apply equation 1048. So that uh, is found with the number of body coils plus 1.5 inch plus 1.5 inch. These are the uh, lengths of the two pieces that stick out. Divided by 3 times pi times 1.25 inches. Okay, and let me put a note on here. What I did right in there is based on equation 1048. Let me go ahead and calculate it. So we're going to put in uh, 0.09 raised to the fourth times 29.5 times 10 to the sixth divided by 10.8 times 1.25 times 4.25 plus 1.5 times 2 over 3 times pi times 1.25. Okay. So this gives me a number, 31.827. What does that number actually mean? Okay. So this is, again, torque per turn. What do you think the torque is that, uh, that pops out of here? Okay, inch pounds per turn. Okay, and that would be the spring constant for the torsion spring. Well, how do I use that? Okay, what direction does the force F apply to lever CD in this case? Because we have this torsion spring applied to uh, lever CD. Force F is always going to be transmitted through member BC. So what direction is the force going to get applied to that lever? Okay, yeah, but it's, it, it's going to be horizontal, right? Even as the lever starts to move, it will continue to be horizontal, right? So what that means that we need to do is imagine the geometry of what happens with that lever and understand that we have essentially a situation where the uh, pin down at the bottom, which I believe was joint, joint D, okay, we have some reactions there, F, D, Y, and F, D, X, okay, but then we also have this torque coming from the spring. And then we have a force being applied up to the top of this piece that is 70 pounds. Okay. 
the length of the lever remains at 3 inches. And what else might we need to know about this situation? Okay, we probably should put in an angle, okay, the angle of theta. All right, and how does this help us? Okay, let's look at the torque equation around point D. So we'll do an equilibrium equation where we sum moments around point D. Okay, I have torque in the spring minus 70 pounds times what? Three inches, but I don't want the entire three inches, right? I only want the height that goes from here up to here. So what's that height? Okay. Is it cosine theta? Okay. Why is it cosine theta? Okay. Yeah, you are measuring, basically, you need to figure out the adjacent angle, right? Because you're trying to figure out this adjacent length to where the angle is being uh, measured, okay? So we use the cosine of theta, and that's set equal to zero. All right, well, that, does that help us? All by itself, it doesn't help us a whole lot, but what can we do for T-spring? Okay, yeah, T spring is going to be equal to K prime times the number of turns. What's the number of turns? Theta divided by 360. Okay. Again, I always doubt myself on these as I kind of do a, a, a double... So if theta is in degrees, then we need to turn this into, yeah, that seems right. Yes. All right, so what should we do now? We should plug this in to our equation we had up there. So let's plug it in. We have 31.827 inch pounds per turn. Okay multiplied by uh, theta over 360 degrees. is going to be equal to 70 pounds times 3 inches times the cosine of theta. All right, and if we punch this in, I think I do have the solution for this. This turns out to be 87.89 degrees. All right, so, and that accounts for the change in geometry um, of the system as well as the, you know, change in the amount of torque as it begins to deform. Any questions? This right here, you're talking about the uh, torque in the spring is equal to K times the uh, number of turns. Um, the closest thing you've got is equation 1052. Equation 1052 actually uh, all in one equation combines um, K. So it basically gives you the theta uh, in terms of K and T. Okay, so you might, uh, I'll say C equation um, 1052 
even though this is not directly using 1052, it's just giving you um, the amount of angular deflection in terms of um, a moment, right, which is a torque. That's the M in that term. All right, other questions? Four point five two turns is how the spring was built to begin with. It means the spring wire would was wrapped four and a quarter times, right? And the quarter is not insignificant, right? It needed to be uh, a four and one quarter because if I just did four, it would have been straight over, right? So four and a quarter brought it up to the position that I actually have it shown. That would be the number of of uh, body coils. Yep. Other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, the question was, can we show the topics again? So um, I will, uh, anyone who wants to stay a few minutes can, but I will see everyone else uh, after a little while. <laughs>